and welcome to the second week of lectures in great experiments in psychology. Uh, in this week, we are going to cover uh, the different experiments and studies uh, that have been done under the purview of cognitive and social psychology. Cognitive and social psychology is a very interesting area which came to develop in uh, the last century primarily. It started uh, quite a while ago, but uh, as psychology developed into an experimental science, but with time, especially in the last century, cognitive psychology uh, took uh, got more prominence. Social psychology also became important with the importance uh, of given to several cu various cultures and especially their influences on and social behavior, its influences on the individual's psychological makeup. Today's lecture, so between the lectures of 6 and 10, we are going to cover some of the topics and some of the great studies in cognitive and social psychology. But in today's lecture, we will go back a little and we will discuss one of the masters of psychology, primarily who started, who revolutionized experimentation and who showed that in psychology, you can carry on with exper experimentation on and one single individual and you can do it scientifically and with your research findings being recorded over the centuries and still it is used today. Now, such an individual is Hermann Hebbinghaus. Hermann Ebbinghaus uh, lived between 1850 and 1909 and Ebbinghaus thus as you can understand he was there during Wilhelm Wundt's time. Now, Wilhelm Wundt worked on consciousness and he was working on uh, several ideas as to his uh, on action, especially on sensation, feeling and he gave his voluntarism theory, which was later taken up by Titchener, Kulpe and several others. But on the same time, during the same time, another individual that is Hermann Ebbinghaus started working by himself individually and his work is on memory. It is still uh, one of the major experimentations done and uh, that too during it was carried out imagine during way back in the 19th century. Now, Wundt claimed that it was impossible to conduct experiments on the higher mental processes, but Ebbinghaus he was also a German psychologist and he was working alone and began to experiment successfully on the higher mental processes. Ebbinghaus worked isolated away from any academic environment. He worked alone in his uh, home at his home and he uh, started he became influenced by Fechner and he wanted to investigate learning. Now, um, Wundt said that you cannot actually study learning and Ebbinghaus proved him wrong and he showed that learning and memory can be experimentally verified and it can be studied. Ebbinghaus was born near Bonn in Germany in 1850. He had studied, finished his college studies in the University of Bonn and universities in Halle and Berlin. And during his academic training, his interest shifted from history and literature to philosophy in which he received his degree in 1873. Now, if you see Ebbinghaus was very different from his contemporary peers. So, most of them were physiologists, physicists who were uh, translating their ideas into psychology. Ebbinghaus on the other hand had his academic background, he had pursued his academics in history and literature. And he pursued seven years of independent study in England and France and finally, his interest changed more towards science. He also served the Prussian War after this and three years just before Wundt established his laboratory at Leipzig that is uh, Ebbinghaus bought a second hand copy of Fechner's great work in one of the London bookstores and that is the elements of psychophysics. And this work of Fechner really influenced Ebbinghaus. And he was really excited to see that the psychological phenomena could be studied and he resolved to do for psychology what Fechner had done for psychophysics. So, he started he planned to use strict and rigid uh, systematic measurement to understand learning and memory. Mm -hmm. 
So, his goal Hermann Ebbinghaus's goal was to apply the experimental method to the higher mental processes. Now, what do you understand by the higher mental processes? It could be nowadays we can of course understand that higher mental processes would be involving a lot of processes that would uh, primarily re be related to cognition. But at that point in time, the British associationists were already planning to take up the work on learning, human learning and Ebbinghaus also chose to undertake his research on human learning and memory. So, uh, what was the current status of research on learning and memory at that time? At that point in time, the customary way to study learning was to examine the associations that were already formed. And the British associationists as I mentioned were studying it in this way. So, how is, uh, how do we form our associations? So, that is what was being studied by the British associationists. So, according to Ewinghaus, investigators were working backward. So, they were attempting to determine how the connections had already been established. So, when a learning has been done already, people were trying to establish how this uh, connection was formed. So, now Ewinghaus wanted to show or wanted to see for himself how these connections were being formed by actually doing it through experimentation. And that is where his work was different from the other researchers of his time. So, Ebbinghaus began his study with the initial formation of associations. So, he was not doing a post hoc study, what we now know as the post hoc studies, where it is primarily quasi experimental research as we call it, where the individual is studying a phenomena that has already happened. Now, that is how the British associationists were trying to understand learning. Ebbinghaus started to study, he wanted to explore how learning was being formed by actually creating the experimental condition to for learning to happen. Now, in this way he could control the conditions under which the chain of ideas were formed and thus make learning more objective. So, see he is actually following the principles of scientific research where the independent variable can be manipulated and here the in this way he is trying to make the learning more objective. So, earlier research was more of the British associations research was primarily more of quasi experimental or post hoc. In this case there the, uh, the uh, independent variable could not be manipulated. In this case the to make it more objective he is starting from scratch. So, Ebbinghaus's work on learning and forgetting has been judged as one of the great instances of original genius in experimental psychology. So, in today's uh, lecture though you know Ebbinghaus is though we as we have I just started the lecture by saying that cognitive and social psychology developed way later after a psychology had established itself as a science there then too I am talking of Ebbinghaus as one of the major cognitive psychologists of his time and that is also in the 19th century. One of the reasons is that because Ebbinghaus had started his research on cognitive psychology at that uh, the, at the time when nobody could even think about uh, developing systematized research in this form. And it is one of the greatest instances of original research in experimental psychology. So, whenever we are talking of great studies in psychology, no way can be can we mention uh, can we uh, forget about Hermann Ebbinghaus. It was Hermann Ebbinghaus's study was the first venture into a truly psychological problem area, and it was not a part of physiology, as was true of so many of Wundt and others other contemporaries' research topics. So basically, one of the reasons perhaps being that most of them being physiologists of that time, they were uh, trying to explore those areas that were already being undertaken by physiology. Hermann Ebbinghaus since his back academic background was also a little different from his contemporaries dealt into something that was really contemporary as to uh, it was a truly psychological problem area. And uh, it was very different from how the others were approaching the problem. Ebbinghaus's revolutionary research broadened considerably the scope of experimental psychology. <laughs>
So, in one hand I am talking of experimental psychology, on the other I am talking of cognitive psychology. Mind you cognitive psychology explores learning and memory and it does it through experimentation and this work was begun by Hermann Ebbinghaus. So, learning and memory had never been studied experimentally as Wilhelm Wundt had said they could not be. Ebbinghaus set out to do so even though he had no academic appointment, no university setting in which to conduct his work or no, no students or no teachers or no labor laboratory to assist him. Nevertheless, over a period of 5 years, he carried out his research alone in a series of carefully controlled and comprehensive studies using only himself as the subject. So, he did not have a group of students whom on whom he could uh, explore or experiment on. He did not have a university backup nor a laboratory to continue his research, but he did all his experiments by himself as himself as the subject. So, um, Ebbinghaus's research basic he for the basic measure of learning he adapted a technique from the associationist who had proposed the frequency of associations as a condition of recall. Now, whenever we are talking of memory there are one or two major principles that we must understand. Uh, so, one is for earlier it was uh, you know as uh, memory studies developed over time and if many of you who are students of psychology you know that primarily when we are talking of memory we are talking of three major processes. One of them being encoding, storage and retrieval. So, encoding is how you are registering the information, storage is as you can well understand how you are storing that information in your brain and retrieval would primarily involve two processes, one would be recall and the other would be recognition. Okay. So, uh, here um, Ebbinghaus adopted some of a technique from the associationist who had proposed that frequency of associations would be a condition of recall. So, how you recall an, a material, so how you retrieve the material from your memory, from your storage would actually depend on how many associations you have formed. So, this is what the associationists were saying and Ebbinghaus adopted this technique and he reasoned that the difficulty of learning memory a uh, material could be measured by this frequency. So, you could understand by counting the number of repetitions needed for one perfect reproduction of the material. So, how complex is the material you can understand by how many times is required to learn that material. So, say if there is one small rhyme say um, say something like Jack and Jill or uh, one uh, any other rhyme Humpty Dumpty say. So, for these uh, these rhymes how much time is it taking for you to learn that material will actually give a uh, measure of uh, how many repetitions. So, how many times you have to repeat this to learn it and how much time is being taken will actually give you a measure of how complex the material is. Now, as you can see that this is also uh, in this was influenced by Fechner. So, Fechner measured sensations indirectly by measuring the stimulus intensity necessary to produce a JND. So, so just for, for to measure sensation Fechner studied the uh, now amount of stimulus that needed to be increased to have a certain sensation. We have discussed about this in the previous classes. So, Ebbinghaus was influenced by Fechner we have talked about this earlier and Ebbinghaus also um, tried to address the issue of memory in a similar manner. So, he said that to understand how complex a material is or to understand to me measure memory you need to understand the number of trials or repetitions that is required to learn the material. So, um, say if, if I put it like uh, you have um, you are learning 10 numbers. So, it could be something like 
um, um, say one number has three digits. So, it could be say like 7, 1, 3, uh, 6, 4, 5, 8, 9, 6. Say I have 10 such numbers. So, how long? So, this is trial 1. So, how many can you remember? Say perhaps you can remember only 4. So, how many trials are required for you to learn this material? So, this is T1 it could be T 2. So, and this whole material how long is it requiring for you to learn. So, that will determine whether this is how complex this material is. Now, um, he also said that the materials to be learned the for to learn for the material to be learned Ebbinghaus devised similar but not identical list of syllables. We will talk about these syllables uh, very soon and he said that the repetition of the task was required to check the accuracy. So, you learn it now after some time you recall it again. So, you see how much of it you can remember and to cancel out variable errors from trial to trial and obtain an average measure that was also very important. So, Ebbinghaus was very systematic in his experimentation. Just imagine at that time in the 19th century, he regulated his personal habits as well, keeping them as constant as possible and following an unvarying routine, always learning the material at a particular time of the day, same time of the day. Say, when we are conducting experiments today, in if you are carrying out experiments on any psychological variable, uh, we say that one of the uh, features that can actually affect the results is the time when you are conducting the experimentation. So, you need to keep it in control. So, as a controlled variable like if you are conducting some memory experiment, some learning experiment say at morning you are teaching uh, a student uh, something at morning uh, any individual and then the next day's experiment if you do it at noon perhaps the results will vary. One of the major reasons being that the time of the day may also have an impact on the results. Why? Now, it could be that the student, uh, the individual on whom you are trying to conduct the experiment uh, ha wakes up late, has a habit of getting up late. So, he is more fresh during the afternoon as compared or maybe uh, during night uh, as compared to the early hours of the morning. So, if you conduct the exper if the results of the experiment show that uh, the, uh, the learning uh, to learn uh, uh, 10, uh, t 10 digits at morning took uh, 20 trials and uh, the next day the learning took um, in the afternoon took 7 trials. So, you could not interpret that it is because of the um, easy uh, the complexity of the material. So, the morning one was more complex as compared to the afternoon one. It could also be that the individual was more alert during the afternoon as compared to the morning. So just, just imagine we use these conditions uh, right now these days when we are conducting experimentation. We also try and control the time of the day the diurnal variation we keep that into account. And way back Ebbinghaus when he was conducting the experimentation on himself, he was so systematic he tried to control it, uh, control the diurnal variation and its effects on memory. So, that is why he would conduct it at a particular time each same time each day and he would generally follow an unvarying routine. So, it is not that you know uh, he was awake at night and that would have an impact on his uh, performance at morning. So, um, so, the next next comes in the material with which you would conduct the learning. Now, this is where Ebbinghaus is known for the use of nonsense syllables. Nonsense syllables is uh, an amazing thing that Ebbinghaus invented. So, he uh, his idea was that if it is um, uh, familiar material, these this material may have associations for one individual, may have may not have associations for another individual. So, the learning is then dependent on what meaning the material has to the individual. On the other hand, uh, if so we are not actually th that is uh, that is another variable that is confounding the results. Uh, 
just like in the previous session as we mentioned the mm, uh, time would be a factor that uh, would be a variable that would affect the results. So, uh, Eving has used nonsense syllables. Now, what are nonsense syllables? Nonsense syllables are a syllables presented in a meaningless series to study memory processes. So, students who are actually uh, psychology students who are trying to uh, who are attending this course will be very familiar with the term nonsense syllables. Some a few nonsense syllables that I will um, just try and write for you say CAD. Now, FEP may not be a nonsense syllable, FEC would be F E C. Okay. So, now when I am, so these are, so this is a consonant, a vowel and another consonant. So, that is how a nonsense syllable is made. Mind you, we will have to remember that Eming has conducted his experiments in German and these were translated later into English. So, we these days uh, conduct, uh, we can make nonsense syllables like this. And so, basically it is a consonant, a vowel and a consonant and we make it as 3. Ebbing was in his time did not make nonsense syllables of only 3 letters, they could be 4 even to the extent of 6 letters, but they were meaningless in a series of words that were meaningless. The idea of using nonsense syllables is then these will not have associations. Say if I uh, give, uh, give an individual to learn a list where there is Tom uh, ate apple, okay, ape job, um, hep. So, here if since these are meaningful words, I may form certain associations and remember them. Now, that would actually not be uh, and say suppose there is another individual who is not familiar with the language or who does not have associations with Tom or ate or ape, then he would uh, not be able to remember these words. So, I am remembering this because of the associations that I can um, form. So, now that would not give a proper measure. So, Ebbinghaus that is why to make this material neutral for everybody, Ebbinghaus uh, created nonsense syllables. Titchener noted that the use of the nonsense syllables marked the first significance advance in the field since the time of Aristotle. So, Titchener gave him this accolade saying that this is the biggest uh, invention of its time in psychology. So, in the 1980s, uh, actually, you know, as I was just mentioning, uh, research by a German psychologist to translate all of Eb Ebbinghaus's footnotes, original footnotes in his publications, showed that the nonsense syllables, as Ebbinghaus suggested, were not always limited to three letters. They were not necessarily nonsense, some of the syllables were four, five, or six letters long. What Ebbing has actually meant was a meaningless uh, series of syllables, and the subject matter of his research was incorrectly correct, translated in English as nonsense syllables. But nevertheless, um, it does have um, it, it, nonsense syllables are meaningless, and that is how we try and uh, construct them today as uh, in our laboratory research and it has really revolutionized the memory research. So, to Evangos it was not the individual syllables that were designed to be meaningless, but rather that the entire list of stimulus words would be meaningless. So, one would not be able to construe meaning from that. So, deliberately they were constructed to be free of prior connections or associations as we just mentioned. So, <coughs> Ebbinghaus has designed several studies using his meaningful, meaningless series of syllables to determine the influence of various experimental conditions on human learning and retention. So, let us just study, uh, discuss two of his studies. First one is to investigate the difference between the speed of memorizing 
li memorizing lists of syllables versus the speed of memorizing meaningful material. So, what was he trying to do here? He was giving a list of, um, so between the speed of memorizing the list of syllables, so this is a meaningless ones and as compared to a meaningful one. So, how long would it take one to remember the meaningful material? as well as the nonsense material. So, would it take the same amount of time? What Ebbinghaus did was, he used Don Juan, uh, Byron's Don Juan and he uh, saw that each stanza had 80 syllables. So, he, he saw that it required approximately 9 readings to memorize one stanza. On the other hand, he then memorized, so he controlled the material by introducing 80 syllables of meaningless material. Okay. So, uh, meaningless series of uh, syllables and then he saw and then he learned it and he saw that it required 80 repetitions. So, to learn the Don Juan which is meaningful material. Um, of the same amount of uh, syllables, so that is 80 syllables, it took him 8 readings and here um, in, uh, the 80 meaningless uh, syllables, meaningless series of 80 syllables required 80 repetitions. So, he concluded that meaningless or unassociated material is approximately 9 times harder to learn than meaningful material. So, that is uh, very obvious to us even today in our daily life, how do we use it? See nobody studied, it may be obvious, but nobody studied this before Ebbinghaus. The thing is that when we are trying and um, when we are trying to learn something, we generally remember it through associations. So, uh, we use either an acronym or we try and associate it with uh, on a different, this part of the page this material is written, that is how uh, we are trying to remember it or say I learnt it uh, when this teacher used this example and that helped me to learn it better. So, we are always trying to associate it with something. So, meaningful material is easier to remember when we are trying and using more associations. So, a meaningless material is obviously harder. So, in another way if we are, if we find meaning in what we are learning, we will remember it better. Now, uh, Ebbinghaus uh, then showed the forgetting curve, okay, we will discuss on this a little later. And uh, to study the effect, the second study that he did was to study the effect of the length of the material to be learnt on the number of repetitions necessary for a perfect reproduction. So, how much of material, so that uh, you know the, how much of material you are learning is actually going to effect the number of times you will require to repeat it. So, he found that longer material requires more repetitions and more time to learn. Now, he occasionally what he did, he actually see at that point in time, he manipulated the independent variable, he changed that is he changed the number of syllables, he increased the number of syllables to be learned and he saw that the average time to memorize a syllable increased. So, if you make the task longer, then it takes more time to learn it and you know the, this is of course, predictable uh, in our daily life. We all know that the more we have to learn, the longer it takes us to learn, but nobody as I mentioned earlier also, nobody showed it through experimentation and he experimentally verified it. The other thing that uh, you know uh, these days you will many of you students who are conducting experiments on memory uh, will know that uh, one of the experiments we uh, try and do in the um, uh, preliminary classes of psychology is whole versus part learning, where we try and um, either you know uh, we compare whether whole learning is better or part learning is better, where you the length of the material is um, when uh, uh, say if you are trying to learn 12 syllables at a time, how long is it taking, how many repetitions or how many trials is it taking you to learn that. And when on the other hand, when you are using uh, a smaller list say half the material, then how long is it taking you to learn it. So, several times, uh, so this is a common very uh, common experiment that we <coughs> conduct in our um, 
uh, preliminary classes and foundation classes in psychology. So, uh, it is uh, this is one of the experiments that Ebbinghaus did way back in the 1890s. And so, what is Ebbinghaus's contribution to learning and memory research? Ebbinghaus spoke about the learning curve as in you know with his he showed it through a represent graphical representation how with the increase in each trial the uh, number of trial the number of syllables uh, is increased uh, the number of the learning increases. So, then he spoke about the forgetting curve and of the over learning effect. So, he spoke I uh, will uh, just come to the forgetting curve. So, basically he said that if if you learn a material and then you do not rehearse that material. So, you do not um, repeat it or uh, rehearse that practice that material, then over time it will gradually get lost a certain amount of it with a large amount of it will get lost in the next 20 minutes. Then within an hour and as you can see over hours and days a lot of material will be lost. So, uh, he showed that you know this showed the importance of uh, how much um, that rehearsal and this also showed that a certain amount of material information is uh, recalled uh, it can be recalled or can be retained after learning and may, most of it is lost. He also spoke about the overlearning effect overlearning effect indicates that there is say there is an optimum number of times that you need to repeat to learn a list completely. So, you are trying to learn uh, a poem. So, you need perhaps 8 trials or 8 repetitions to learn it completely, but as the forgetting curve shows a lot of it will be uh, forgotten very soon within the next 20 minutes and then within the nod. So, over learning indicates after that how much time are you spending on um, further learning the list. So, Ebbinghaus says that the more you overlearn the so after that optimum number of trials if you learn it more the number of times that you use to learn it more the longer the time your that information will be retained. So, uh, students uh, can definitely uh, see an implication of this in your regular work say if you are um, just learning it the day before the exam you have learned it uh, to the optimum uh, for you to remember it till the end of the exam paper. So, you will see that you will not be able to recall it uh, after a couple of days. On the other hand if there is material that you have learned as we say thoroughly for uh, where you have over learned. So, you have gone beyond that optimum uh, number of times then you recall it better even days after the examination is over. So, then Ebbinghaus uh, invented several tests of retention and we already spoke about the recall where he used two types of recall tasks. So, one is the free recall and the other is the serial recall. So, the free recall is you remember say material from a list of syllables you remember it randomly. So, maybe you know as you remember as you can recall it. So, maybe you recall the first syllable first then the last one and then maybe uh, second and uh, last but one. So, that way it is random the order is not important serial recall is an attempt to recall the list of items in a serial order as it was presented. Now, as you can understand uh, you know serial recall would be tougher than free recall because uh, even if you try it out uh, try out creating a nonsense syllable list and try out try to learn the material you will see that you will remember the last ones better as compared to the and the first ones then, but not the middle ones. So, the, the this is of course, uh, gives uh, uh, takes us to the primacy and the recency effect. Primacy effect would be the first ones that you learned are remembered because they were learnt at uh, without any interruptions or interference of other similar material. The last ones are remembered because that is the last thing that you have heard. So, it is uh, so that is the recency effect. So, uh, this is uh, recall. Uh, so, definitely if you are trying to remember it in a serial order then it is tougher because even though your uh, last syllables may be, may be uh, 
um, you know, in your uh, in the tip of your tongue. Uh, but you will have to try and recall it in order. So then he spoke about uh, recollection, and he showed that this technique is a more sensitive test of memory than recall. So a person may be able to recognize an item that he or she may not be able to recall. So their uh, so recall re recollection or recognition would be another way of uh, getting information from retrieval so or retrieving information from storage so um, so these are uh, and of course he spoke about savings so to he said that if you are trying to rememorize a list that is learnt earlier that would take way less a time as compared to something that you've learned early uh, learning for the first time that's why we say that revision is very important so if you had a vision earlier then a revision will help you to remember things better so uh, it will also take less time when you uh, see it for the second time so to learn it uh, it'll take less time to learn it and serial position curve so he said the that it is important as i mentioned of the uh, serial position basically talks about the primacy and the recency effect that i just mentioned mm -hmm. so what is the significance of ebbinghaus's work ebbinghaus's work is as the significance is in his careful control of the experimental conditions his quantitative analysis of the data and his conclusion that learning time per syllable as well as total learning time both increases with longer list of syllables so this is something that he had done way back so many years ago and he also showed that the he also studied other uh, variables influencing learning and memory and he showed the effect of overlearning he showed the association within the list reviewing material and the time elapsed between learning and recall and his research was also on the effect of time uh, yielded by the famous ebbinghaus forgetting curve so we have discussed that too so these are uh, you know the impacts of his study these researches have led to several studies later on so we will um, you will come across uh, the dual model of memory the levels of processing model of memory and then working memory and there have been several other memory studies that have started with primarily ebbinghaus's research so these are some of ebbinghaus's publications so on memory a contribution to experimental psychology see he wrote this in 1885 and journal of psychology and physiology of sense organs so this was in 1890 which he wrote with the phys another physicist arthur kuenig and the principles of psychology in 1902 and a summary of psychology in 1908 so he was not a part of any university he did not uh, start a journal or he did not have any relationship with any uh, laboratory setting but his Uh, contributions are immense in the field of psychology experimental psychology and cognitive psychology so he introduced learning and memory studies his research was exacting thorough and systematic and we still study it and we still use the nonsense syllables and in the history of psychology no other investigator working alone subjected himself to such a rigid regimented experimentation I think that's about it today. Thank you.